Um, but today we're talking about, um, we're, we're closing the series today, When Life Hurts. And uh, two weeks ago, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about trials. And then last week we talked about what it means to, you know, be corrected because correction never feels good. <laughs> Life hurts actually when you get corrected. Um, and then today, uh, kind of talking through like when you reach your wits end, has anybody ever felt like they reached their wits end either in life or yeah, hands across the America. Um, but at, when, when life hurts and you find yourself, you're completely puzzled, you're completely perplexed. You're not sure what you should do, where the next right step is. Like, I feel like I've been doing all the things and all the right things, but still things kind of aren't progressing forward. So I reached my wits end. Like I've got, I've got nothing left, no more ideas. Uh, and then when you feel like that, sometimes people try to encourage you. You know, have you ever tried to be, has anybody ever tried to encourage you poorly? <laughs> You've ever been that one? You're like, uh, just things, just kind of words fall out of your mouth and you can't take them back, you know, idiot. Um, but people say stuff when they're trying to encourage you and you're like, it's okay, man, you're going to live to fight another day. And you're like, okay, but what about today? Like, how am I just going to get through today? Uh, or what about, it's okay, it's okay. You didn't really want that anyway, or we didn't want that anyway. And you're thinking, yeah, man, but really I did. Like I did, I did want that. And now I got to deal with the fact that I don't have it. <laughs> You're not encouraging me. And we try, we try our best. You know, like we don't like sadness and we don't like people to feel sad. Uh, we just want to help them as quickly as possible to get out of that weird funk. But let me tell you that God works in sadness. You know, it's, an, it's a God-given emotion. If the Lord gave us everything we have and he gave us all of our emotions, then you better believe he can work in and through sadness. And so even in those moments, like, let's not try and quickly get rid of the pain as quickly as possible, but let's see what the Lord wants to do there and be okay with exploring that emotion. Um, but here's an here's a encouragement from Solomon. This is a super fun one. It's You can find it in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4. If you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, oh my gosh, like t Debbie Downer, 100. He is so, whew, but it, it comes, you have to get through the whole thing. Because if you were to pull any, you know, like you Google scriptures, if you just pull a scripture from Ecclesiastes, it will set you down the weirdest path of faith. <laughs> you know, you got to read that one in context. You got to, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's a letter and he gets in there. Anyway, one of the things if you're to pull out, uh, this is encouragement from Solomon. He says, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Like, hey, come on, man. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. You know, that's your encouragement. But I want to just take a minute and explain really quickly because when I, when I read that, it doesn't do anything for me. Like, that's meaningless. Um, and we, in our American culture, we love dogs. You know, we take our dogs in our little knapsacks, and we take them, knapsack. Uh, we take them to the restaurant. We take them. Maybe you haven't tried to bring them into the church building, but you've definitely thought about it. You know, like, can I bring my dog? The answer is no. Um, anyway, but like we love our dogs, you know, like let's 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 bring the dogs everywhere. Not cats. I'm a cat person. Uh, anyway, but to a Hebrew, to an Israelite, <clears throat> dogs were vicious, filthy beasts. Like this is how they perceived dogs. Uh, they they rolled around in the dirt with no master, just lost, lonely, hideous, vicious. Aww. Not to them. They didn't awe at it. Uh, it was it was like it was lowly it, to a Hebrew. It was a picture of all that was common base, lowly, contemptible. Like they didn't have pet dogs. It wasn't on their agenda to have a pet dog in life. Uh, and also for the Hebrew, this is kind of fun, sort of. Um, it was a word picture for a male prostitute. So, you know, even a dead dog or even a live dog is better off than a, a you know, a dead lion. But a lion, on the other hand, you know, to the Hebrews, Proverbs, there's another scripture for it. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 29 through 30, again from Solomon, says, There are three things that are stately in their stride, four that move with stately bearing, a lion, mighty among beasts. You know, they're there. I told my son the other day, we were talking about, my son loves cheetahs. Cheetahs are his favorite animal of all time. And I said something about lions being, you know, the king of the junk, king of, you know, they're the king. They're the animal king, king of the animal kingdom, whatever. And he was like, like heartbroken <laughs> that it wasn't the cheetah. And I'm like, come on, it's not the cheetah. The cheetah runs singularly, not in a pack. The lion is ultimate. Uh, so a lion, it symbolizes what you think it is. Um, they're, they're courageous. They're the most exalted among animals. They're the most, even among men, you know, they're the most glorious and glamorous, you know, could you imagine having a pet lion? <laughs> like, yes. You walk down the street with that sucker. <laughs> oh yeah. 
Okay, anyway, um, <clears throat> but here are three reasons why. I'm going to take that bit of encouragement from Solomon. It's better to be a live dog than a dead lion. And these are three reasons why. In other words, when you have reached the end of your wit, maybe in every area of your life, or maybe just in one area where you feel lowly, you feel common, you feel unable to move beyond the place that you find yourself, and life kind of hurts there, maybe all of life, or maybe just in one place in life, it is still better to be a live dog than a dead lion, and this is three reasons why. Number one, God specializes in tough cases. This is the part where if you're writing stuff down, you can write in that word. <laughs> God specializes in tough cases. In other words, there's nothing that's too hard for our God. There's nothing that's too hard for him. So it's better still to be a live dog, lowly, contemptible, base, common, uh, than a dead, glorious creature. Uh, number two, God specializes in the turnaround. In the turnaround, nothing is impossible for our God. Absolutely nothing is impossible. And then number three, God is writing a page turner. You know, like a really good book that you're reading. <laughs> Probably none of you. <laughs> I'm not going to say none of you are book readers. Less and less people I know are book readers, uh, movie watchers, you know. But a page turner. He's writing your story, your life. He's writing a page turner. In other words, if you were to get into the details of your life, like a good book, you wouldn't be able to, the, to put the story down because you just can't wait to see what's going to happen next. And that's who our God is. He's the author of life. Scripture def defines the Lord that way. He's the author of life. And this is encouragement. You have not yet come to the end of your days. You have not yet come to the end of your days, and he is the author of your life. So I don't know if you've discovered this yet, and I hope that you have. And we push this kind of hard, but the Bible is a page turner. When you get in there and you pick up the whole Bible and you start reading it, uh, you want to know what happens next in some of these people's lives. Like when you when you start, you get to know their names and their stories, and you see kind of all the things uh, that are happening. And when you finish the story of their life, if you've get been in the scripture that way and you've seen him like that, it gives you plenty to think about. Plenty to kind of chew on and to mull over, to question, to wonder. It's some of my favorite times when I get in the scripture and I simply just don't understand it. Like I'm in shock and awe and I'm confused and I've got questions. You know, how could you let that happen? Why did you do that? They love like all the things. And so when you've reached your wits end, and I bring this up because when you reach your wits end, the stories found in scripture are what strengthen your faith. Um, and faith is what you believe. So what you find in scripture is what strengthens your faith or what you believe now. And it increases your hope, which is what you, what you believe for tomorrow, what you hope will happen tomorrow in your life or next week or next year or in your lifetime. Uh, and so if you've, even if you've never read the scripture and you don't know what I'm talking about, Moses was a tough case whose life God turned around. And his story is such a page turner that even if you've never been to church a day in your life and you've never heard any any kind of Bible message at all, you've probably heard of a snippet of something from Moses' life. You know, he's the one who parted the Red Sea. He's the one, there's the 10 plagues in Israel. There's a song written about him. His life is such a page turner that he's made it into secular mainstream society. And if you keep reading, if you get in the scripture, you meet Joshua, who is too old to lead an army. Rahab, the prostitute, who's a part of uh, Jesus' family line. Like in his family line, he was descended from a prostitute way back in there. And then you throw in Samson and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Peter and Paul and Mary. And if you stop and you think about their stories, God did some amazing things in their life. They, they hit times when life was hard, when life hurt. They all had points in, in time when their life was hurting. And I, I want to, we'll come back to it later, but sometimes in scripture and even in our own life, life hurt because of their own doing. Some of these people, you read their story, and it's like, well, obviously. like, And then I was reading today, and I'm thinking, obviously, about them. And I'm going, Tiff, <laughs> you too. But sometimes life hurt because of their own doing. Sometimes life hurt simply because of the actions of the people around them. You know, Israel, they, they were... Um, there's a king who ruled over them. And so the actions of the king affected all of the, the lives of everyone else. So sometimes life hurt just simply because of the people around them. Sometimes life hurt because of their ignorance. <laughs> you know, like what I don't know is better and they never even tried to get to know anything. So sometimes life hurt just because of ignorance. Sometimes, and this is one that gets me, sometimes life hurt simply because of the time and place that God had created and called them to live. 
Just because of the time and place that God had called and created them to live, there was purpose there. But life hurt just simply because of when they were put on the planet, when they were put on the earth, when it was their time to live. And sometimes life hurt, this is another tough one, life hurt when they had to reconcile the purpose of God on their life with what it would cost for them to live out that purpose. In other words, they had seen something great and glorious in God the Father, or they had seen something great in, you know, the Old Testament uh, Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh. They'd seen something great in him, but there was a cost. And so life hurt when they had to count the cost of what it meant to follow him. You read through any of the stories of the prophets. (laughs) Their life was painful, but it was beautiful and glorious, and we reap the benefits of that. And then you read the New Testament and the shame and the rejection and the hurt and the, like, the martyrdom of just what it meant. So life hurt simply God. God is good and my life hurts because you're good. <laughs> make that make sense in your brain. You know what I'm talking about? Like those are those are tough things. And so then we get to a scripture that's very common. Again, even if you've never been to church a day in your life, you may have heard this scripture. Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And some of us we read that, and maybe even today, you're like, respectfully, Lord could you share the plan with me? (laughs) If your plan is so good and great and you have good purposes for me, can I know them? Like just one part, just one part of them, any part of them, like what I should be doing with my life or where I should be working uh, or what I should give up, like anything. And so um, I want to just focus in, we're going to focus in on one person today and it's uh, the person of Lazarus. How we're going to find out that uh, God had a good plan for Lazarus and But what we're going to see is that Jesus was the only one who knew what the good plan was. (laughs) Uh, But this is what happened. Jesus kept inviting the people who followed him, his disciples, to believe that the plan God had for Lazarus would be better than they could have imagined it. And so I just kind of want to peel back the layers. I want to read through that story. So it's found in John chapter 11. And uh, I put the whole scripture on there, but we're going to jump through parts of it. So first of all, John chapter 11, we get in verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So when we set that up, Mary and Martha, these are the ones that Mary and Martha, if you heard the story, um, like one of them sitting at his feet, the other, uh, the other one is running around trying to prepare things and they get in an argument and they want Jesus to solve it. Like she's not helping me. Uh, and then there's the, the story of the perfume. These people, in other words, what I want us to see is that these people are close enough to be in Jesus inner circle. Uh, she's the one who poured the perfume on, on uh, Jesus' feet, and then Judas got all angry and butthurt, if I could use that, because all of that money wasn't given to the poor, when really he just wanted to use it for something else. So these people are close enough to Jesus to be known by Jesus' followers. They are, they are a part of the family, if you will. Okay, so it says, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Pick up in verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the God's son, which is him, may be glorified through it. <laughs> now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Does that sound like love, anybody? Does that sound like love? You love them. You heard they were sick, and so you stayed where you were two more days. You did not, in a hurry, go rush off to see your dying friend or comfort your friends, his sisters, okay? And then, and then he said to his disciples, so after two days, he said, let us go back to Judea. So hold on. I just want to back up for a second because we read so quickly over things, but let's ask some questions. Jesus Did you tell anyone that this sickness would not end in death? Or did you simply say it to yourself? It doesn't say it doesn't say who he told. It just says, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. So have you ever thought something in your head 
and you just didn't communicate it to anyone, and you think, I know, I know there's a plan here, I know there's a purpose here, I know what's going to happen, I know what my next steps are, but you don't open your mouth and say a word to anyone, you just know it on the inside. <laughs> did Jesus do that? Or it was the servants that had gone and told. So did Jesus communicate that to the servants, and did the servants bring that message back? And so he and sparked and inspired hope into the sisters. I don't know. Let's keep going. Okay. But also, this, here's another thing that I'm thinking of. How, Jesus, if you read the parables, he told stories. And even the disciples say, like, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> like, I just, I, can you make that more clear? Why are you always speaking in riddles? Why are you always speaking in puzzles? And so here's another thing. Like, even if he said it out loud and not inside of himself, but do you think there might have been a question, metaphoric, like, Jesus, are you speaking metaphorically? Like, this sickness will not end in death, like, in the future? Or do you mean actually, physically, literally, this isn't going to end in death? And I know if we read the story, we already know how it ends. But I want you to put yourself in those situations where you've had times where you've been asking the Lord or you've been seeking the Lord, and it doesn't seem like he's giving an answer, and so you've got questions. You've got questions, I, and then there's hope. Hope kind of comes into your heart, and you remember words, you remember scripture, and then you ask, is that, like, in the future? it's going to be better. Like, yes, I know in glory, I know in redemption, I know when Jesus comes back, all things are going to be set right. And so am I waiting for that future day? Like, I'm just going to, are you giving me the strength to endure this through my lifetime? And I know there's hope on the other side. Or are you going to do something now to where my story is, is a page turner? You know, sometimes we just, we just don't know. And I want us to see that in this story. And then we already kind of made fun of it, but it doesn't sound like love that you stayed two more days. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you love them so much, why didn't you move quicker? Anybody? Have you ever asked the Lord for things? And you feel like, uh, maybe he did answer, but it was, in your mind, it was too late. Well, I wish you would have shown up 10 days ago. I wish you would have shown up last year. I wish so-and-so could have seen this, but it's too late. Have you ever felt like God did not move fast enough in your life? So let's keep going. Jesus and the disciples, so they'd already been, I, I, I removed some of the scriptures, so we don't have to read it all, so I'm going to set it up for you. Jesus and the disciples had already been in Judea, where Lazarus was. They had been there, and they were treated so poorly that they left the area. And so the disciples are ready to move on. They're, Jesus and the disciples, they're going somewhere else. They've left that town behind them. They're never going back. It was painful. They have no desire to return there. And then Jesus comes, and he says, Lazarus is sleeping, so let us go return to him. And the disciples are like, no. If he's sleeping, he'll get better. <laughs> I'm not going back there. And so we pick it up in verse 4. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So here's the question. Believe what? Believe what? Believe what? Have you ever felt like the Lord has given you only part of an answer? He's only ministered to you part, and He says, "I need you to believe." And you're going, "Believe what? Trust what?" The disciples have no idea what's going on. Jesus is the only one who has an idea of what's happening, and He is not being quick to share the details. <laughs> not at all. Have you ever been in that place of frustration? Jesus knows that Lazarus, and then he says Lazarus is dead. Back up. Because Jesus, you said that this sickness would not end in death. So now I'm way confused. <laughs> you said it wouldn't end in death, and Lazarus is dead, and so that's why we have to go back there. And I want us to see the dynamics of what's happening here, because Mary and Martha have a brother whom Jesus loves. Scripture says that. Who is very sick, and so they send word to him. And their expectation, based on the fact that Jesus loves them, is that he is going to come quickly and make their brother better. They have an expectation that when I call on my God, when I call on him who I believe is Lord, he is going to come quickly. And he's going to make it better because he loves me and he loves him. And because of his love for him, he's coming quickly. And the disciples, they're on a mission with Jesus. They just came out of a hectic situation where the crowd had picked up stones to stone their rabbi. They, they, they gave everything to follow this man, and he almost was stoned to death in this town. And so they think they've left that place behind, and they never have to go back there. 
But Jesus tells them that we're going back because Lazarus is asleep when on their terms, what he really is, is dead. And so then there's a question, why did you say he was asleep if he was dead? And again, Jesus is the only one who knows what's going on, and he isn't making it plain to anyone. And if you look at the story, he doesn't seem to be in a hurry about sharing plainly what he does know. He already knows the answer. He already knows what's going to happen. He already has the plan, but he's not being quick to reveal it. And so here, let's let it sink in. Has life ever hurt that bad? Have you ever been in that place of frustration or confusion or unmet expectation? And not just with people, but with Jesus, the master. I mean, probably Mary and Martha were a little bit offended. Have you ever been offended because God hasn't come to, the, to your rescue, because he hasn't answered quickly enough? So frustrated, angry, confused, sad, but also still kind of hopeful and at the same time full of doubt, like a whole gamut of emotions. So let's keep reading. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. <laughs> So Lazarus is dead, like dead, dead. He's been in the tomb for four days. He had been. He had been sick in bed. And when he was sick in bed, he probably was sleeping. <laughs> but now he's dead. Like he has passed the point of sleep and he has entered death. So they put him into the tomb. So let's just, let's just imagine for a second that Jesus did not say only to himself that the sickness would not end in death. Let's say he communicated that to the servants who had come. And so let's say that the messengers sent that word back to Mary and Martha. This sickness will not end in death. How much more confused is hurt is everyone now? And how much more hurt is everyone? If Jesus said this sickness will not end in death, he didn't show up and then Lazarus died. Did you lie? <laughs> I mean, would you, can, can you imagine asking the Savior if he lied to you? <laughs> But honestly, if we search the depths of our hearts, sometimes those things happen. Life hurts. And so has, has what you hoped for ever panned out differently than how you anticipated it would? On the way to God's best for you, have you ever had to endure heartache? On the way to God's best, have you had to endure heartache? Sometimes to open up our small box of thinking God has to expand what we believe is possible. And oftentimes, our ability to be open to more comes through the death of what has been. It's through the death of what has been, through that sadness, through that loss, through that pain, through that suffering, that we become open to the idea that God has more for me. And maybe what I thought was really good isn't what really what's best, but it takes sadness. It takes some hurt. It takes some pain. It takes some trial to realize that was good for a season, but that's not good for the rest of my life. God has more for me. So let's keep going. <clears throat> Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. <laughs> so you can hear it in her voice. Martha is hopeful. She says, if you had been here, you could have kept him from dying. But I believe you can still do something. I, with you, I don't think it's too late. Like, I don't know what it is, but with you, I don't think it's too late. <laughs> and then Mary, they came separately to Jesus. So when Mary comes, she's, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Nothing else. So in, in Martha, we hear hope. Like, I wish this would have turned out differently, but I still believe. I, there's hope. I don't know what it is, but I think there's still some. She's still calling on the name of the Lord and believing. Mary, on the other hand, just completely falls apart before Jesus. Heartbroken. That's it. That's the end. You didn't show up for me. And I want you to notice that Mary, it's Mary the one who's heartbroken, completely lost, no hope. And she is the one who gave up her whole life when she washed Jesus' feet with that perfume. 
because that was her burial. It cost her. It cost her everything to get that perfume. And then she didn't save it for her burial. She put it on Jesus' feet. So Mary, who had given up everything, her whole way of life is completely heartbroken when Jesus doesn't show up and she asks him to. <laughs> Have you ever been there? I know I'm getting in deep. You guys are all reflecting on your hearts and in your lives. Okay, and then here's another thing. This is all happening. Mary, Martha comes. Mary comes. They're overhearing, and then there's a crowd of people because the Jews and the Israelites, they don't mourn singularly as one family unit. They mourn as a whole. So there's a whole, you know, nation of people with them. And this is what they said. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. So in the middle of their sadness, in the middle of their mourning, then there's, there's people and they make comments, okay? If you read the Gospels, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read the stories of the miracles that Jesus performed, you know that Jesus didn't even need to be in the room. He didn't need to even be in the same city. He didn't need to be anywhere near a sick person for them to be healed. You can read about it in the scripture, but Jesus said the word, and at that moment in time from a distance, the servant of a Roman was healed. He didn't even need to be there. He just said the word. And so some of them asked, couldn't he have done that? <laughs> the, uh, I want you to get the offense in the room. It's not in the room. They're outside. I want you to get the offense of the situation. Have you ever asked those questions? If you could do it for them, could you not do it for me? If you could do it for them, could you not do it for the ones, even if it's not for me, but if you could do it for them, could you just do it for the ones I love? Like, even if it's not me. And so we, we, we sense a hint of rejection. And rejection is hard to swallow. Jesus, we'll pick it up. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Now, I want us to to pick up on deeply moved. So Jesus knew the weight of the emotion that everyone was carrying. He could hear it. He's a person. He's, He's not dumb. Okay. He could hear it. He could sense it. He could see it. And he was not untouched. Even though he's the Savior, he's the King of all kings who left everything and he became a person, he is not untouched by the stirring questions in their hearts. They're they're stirring in in his heart. He knew what he was doing. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew that it was going to end well, but he was still compassionate towards the hurt that people were experiencing. He was still compassionate towards the confusion and the hopelessness that people were carrying. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, the human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. And that's kind of, I think, what Mary was experiencing. It was a crushed spirit. Like, I can endure sickness. I can endure my brother not getting better. I can endure the fact that maybe this wasn't in your plan, but a crushed spirit, the fact that you didn't even show up, the fact that you let it, I can't, I can't stomach that. I can't, that's hard. And I bring this up because if you've ever felt like that, there are stories in the Bible. These people have been through what you've been through, and so there's comfort because there are people who have gone before you. And, and um, sometimes I think when, when hard times come, we just like to Google scriptures. And like, let me see if I can, if I can Google a scripture that will help me. And I've done that, but more times than not, I've walked away confused and like, I guess the word isn't going to help me because I couldn't Google a scripture that met my need. And it's not in Googling scriptures. It's in knowing the stories of the people where God has impacted their lives. And so when we get into the word and we know the stories and we see how it all lines together, we see what God is doing. Okay, so after he comes to this, this, he says, take away the stone. He said, pick it up again. (laughs) But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor for it has been four days. Okay, 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 okay. She is the one who said, but I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus is over here going, well, do you want me to do something or not? Like you said, I'll, you know, even like I know that he's gone, but you can still do something. And so he goes to do something. He goes to move. He goes to make something happen. And Martha says, don't do that. Like whatever you do, don't do that. You know, Jesus is saying, it seemed like you wanted me to do something, but now that he's doing it, you're not comfortable with the way he's going about it. 
Come on. Anybody? You believe God can move in your life. You believe God can move in the situation. And then things start to shake and, and get turned turned around and, and this and this and that. And then, but you become uncomfortable with what is happening. Like, nope. You, it'll be smelly. It'll be stinky. That'll be hard. That'll be gross. I don't, I don't want that. Then Jesus said, and I love it. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? And so Martha's seeing like, yeah, at the end, you know, when we all come back together with you. I'm going to see glory. I don't need to see it now. Like, I don't need to see the stench. I don't need that in my life. Martha, I'm paraphrasing. Do you want me to do what the father has told me to do? Do you want to see my glory? Do you want to see me come through for you? Then let me work. Basically is what I was saying. Like, I know I'm going to make you uncomfortable, and I know this isn't what you pictured, and I know I haven't given you the whole story, and I know this is going to be painful, but let me work. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you will always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. Now, that's just funny. Like, I think that's funny because in all of the emotion, there's sadness, there's crying, there's confusion, there's anger, there's bitterness, there's hurt. And Jesus, I think, is being funny because he said, he, he prays the prayer out loud and he says, I know that you hear me, but for these people, <laughs> for these people, I want them to know the glory. Okay, so all that said, uh, verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Mummy. That's a mummy right there. <laughs> okay. The mummy came out. Jesus woke up the dead man because after all, he had only been sleeping. <laughs> ah! Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I'm going to kind of wrap this all up. Maybe you are in a tough chapter of your life. Or maybe you have empathy for someone who is in a tough chapter of their life. And can I just encourage you and say that the book has not come to an end. Your story has not come to an end. Don't let the tough chapters destroy the rest of the story. Because our God is the author of life. And honestly, the tough chapters when you read a book are the ones that make the book good. They're the ones that make the book worth reading. Not because they stay in that tough place, but because there's resurrection, because there's redemption, because there's understanding, because there's growth, because there's transformation. And without the tough chapters, those things don't happen to the characters that we love. And if you're in the story, then you're the characters that God loves. And there is purpose in all the things that he is doing. And so Jeremiah 29, 11, I'll again read that scripture, but I'll expound on it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And then he says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I want to bring that back because Mary and Martha called on the name of Jesus. They, they were able to send people to him. There's a, there a tangible relationship there. And Jesus didn't ignore them. He heard. And he was already beginning to answer. He already had the answer. He already knew how it was going to end. The difficult part was trusting Jesus in the process. Elsewhere in the scripture, Jesus tells his hearers that blessed are those who are not offended by me. And so what I want to say is it's okay for us to feel like we're offended, to recognize like, I'm, I'm so hurt. I'm so angry. There's some things going on in my life. But Father, or Jesus says, blessed are those who are not offended by you. And so I'm going to take my offense so you don't just carry it be like, oh man, I messed up. I'm offended. That's it. No, 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 no. You take your offense and you say, Father, I am offended. This, hurt, this hurts my feelings. This hurts my life. This confuses me. So I'm going to lay it before you because I know that you're hearing me. And so help me to trust you. Help me to not be offended at the circumstances of my life that they don't look like I want them to. And then I want to ask you, like, you, you simply just ask the Lord. So this doesn't mean that, you know, to seek the Lord with all of our heart, it doesn't mean that we know about God and we keep trying to solve the problem on our own. 
Because that's what so many of us do. That's what I do. Knowing about him isn't seeking him. He means seek him. Ask him where he is in this situation. Ask him how this ends. Ask him where the relief will come from. Because those are the questions our hearts are asking, but we're trying to solve the problem and just hoping he answers, but we don't ever actually bring it to him. Ask him, how does this end? Where are you? How are you going to come through? Seek him. Uh, this makes me think of my kids because sometimes my kids will persistently like blah, ask me so many questions in a row. And I'm like, I have no more answers. I've got no more answers. But what sometimes what will happen is I'll hear the longing in their heart and the anxiousness that's coming up inside of them. And then the Lord will remind me, like hit me on the head, you know. <clears throat> They just want to be comforted. <laughs> so then I'll sit down with them and I'll begin to answer those questions in their heart to settle them. And in the best way that I know, I know how, I'll settle those questions in their heart. I'll get them to a place where they may not have all the answers, but they've got at least peace and they can be at rest while they wait. And our God is better than I am. He's better than you are at doing that and he has promised to hear and he has promised to answer. And so what I want is for us to be encouraged by the story of Lazarus and all the people involved. Because it wasn't just Lazarus, there's a community of people involved in the Lazarus story. And what I want us to do is to stay close to the master as he works. So when life hurts and you find yourself completely puzzled and perplexed, not knowing what to do, when you reach the end of your wit, and maybe in all areas or maybe just one area, you feel lowly, you feel common, you feel unable to move the place you find yourself. It is still better to be a live dog than a dead lion because there is hope for the living. And another question I'd probably encourage you to ask is, you know, and I said some of these people experience hurt because of their ignorance. Some people experience hurt because of the life choices they had made. Some people are experiencing hurt because of the life choices of others. Some people are experiencing hurt simply because of the time and place God had called them to live and he was calling them to rise up and meet the occasion. And then some of the people, their life hurt simply because there was a cost involved in following Jesus. And so in your situation, ask yourself where you are. Not just ask yourself, but before the Lord, Lord, where am I? And what is it that you're doing? And what is it that you're calling me to? Where, where does the answer, where does the relief come from? And so what I want to do now is simply just pray. So if you guys would close your eyes, bow your heads. I'd love to pray with you. Father, I thank you so much for your word that we can be encouraged through the stories of the people who have gone before us. And these aren't just made up stories. These are real live people that you lived with these, these people in particular, you walked among the earth with these people and their stories were recorded that we may find hope, we may find encouragement. And so I thank you, God, that there are tough situations in the Bible, Lord, that speak to our needs today. And I thank you that you are the God who hears and you are the God who answers. Lord, I thank you that you are present in every situation and you already know how it ends and you know what the answers are. And sometimes you reveal those things to us and other times you hold on to them and you say, I just need you to trust me in the process, but you can believe that I have what's best for you. And so I speak that hope and that encouragement into the hearts of the people here today. Maybe we don't know how it ends. Maybe we don't know how it resolves, but I can trust that you are good. Lord, would you stir up the hope in the hearts of the people to believe in faith upon who you are? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know the Lord that way, you wouldn't be able to, to you, don't, you don't know Jesus enough to be able to trust him because you've never actually given him your life and there's a cost involved in not just making him savior, meaning he's coming back, you know, for you when you die or when he comes back, but it's Lord of your life. Like he has permission to lead you, to guide you, and you trust him enough with all of your decisions. If that's not you, but you want it to be, you want to come into that relationship with the father. I just want to invite you to lift up your hand and I love to pray with you. Nobody's looking around, but as an amen, I see your hand. Amen. 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 God is so good. God is so good. And already he's on the move to meet you right where you're at. So church, let's all pray this together. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you're the God of hope. And you sent your son Jesus to bring me into that hope. To bring me into your life. I recognize him as Savior. 
I recognize him as Lord. I repent of my sin and trying to do life on my own. I want you. I want your way. I want your will. I want your kingdom. I want your blessing. I want your favor. I want your provision. I submit myself before you. Would you fill me with your spirit and lead me to do what's right? Amen.